Hello, and welcome to Elevator Pitch Series for the Radiographer. I am Michael, and this is the second video in the series on radiographic imaging. In this video, we'll be looking at radiographic density. We'll be finding out what radiographic density is. We'll also be looking at why radiographic density is important. Lastly, we'll be looking at the factors that affect radiographic density. Radiographic density is the degree of overall blackening on a radiographic image. This means that it is how much blackening you would find on an image. Why is blackening important on an image? Let us explain using this image. If you look at this, you would observe text written in black. There is also an outline of an elevator door drawn in black and a person also drawn in black. You see, the black helps us to identify text, shapes and structures. This is the same way blackening helps us to identify various anatomical and pathological structures on a radiographic image. A radiographic image is basically made of different shades of black, gray and white. The degree of blackening, the density, produced on a radiographic image, depends on the number of photons that get to the image receptor during image production. This means that anything that would cause too many photons to get to the image receptor would cause the image to have too much blackening, an overexposed image. And anything that would cause too little photons to get to the image receptor would cause the image to have too little blackening, an underexposed image. In radiography, we usually aim for a density that is just right. Now, let us look at these factors one by one. First is the milliamperage second, or MAS. In the video on prime factors, we learned that the MAS determines how many photons are produced by the X-ray tube. This makes the MAS the single most important factor affecting radiographic density. It is known as the controlling factor of radiographic density. Other factors that we'd be discussing are known as influencing factors. Now, how exactly is MAS related to density? They have a directly proportional relationship. If the MAS is doubled, the radiographic density will be doubled. And if the MAS is halved, the radiographic density will be halved. The first influencing factor we'll be looking at is distance. In the video on prime factors, we also learned that, as the source of radiation is moved farther away from the image receptor, less intensity of photons make it to the image receptor. Let us illustrate this a little bit further. Let us imagine this is the X-ray tube. And this is the image receptor. The beam of photons produced by the X-ray tube is divergent. Let us imagine these lines are the X-ray photons. I have placed five photons in the beam. Note that this is for simplicity's sake, as X-ray photons travel in millions. Now, observe that with the tube at a short distance from the image receptor, the X-ray photons within the beam are close to each other. Having multiple photons concentrated on one area of the image receptor would produce a great density on that area of the image. Now, what happens when the tube is moved farther away from the image receptor? When the tube is moved farther away from the image receptor, the divergent X-ray beam will continue to spread out, covering a much wider area on the image receptor. If the MAS is kept the same, and we still have our five hypothetical photons, the photons will have to spread out to cover the wider beam area. With less photons concentrated on an area of the image receptor, a less dense image is produced. That explains how the inverse square law works. To keep this video simple and short, we have left out explanations on the use of the inverse square law formula and the density maintenance formula. We will look at examples on these in future videos. Take note for now that the inverse square law formula is used to calculate the new intensity of X-ray photons that would get to the image receptor when the distance is changed. The density maintenance formula on the other hand is used to calculate the new MAS that would be needed to compensate for a change in the distance and produce the same radiographic density. The next influencing factor that affects radiographic density is kilovoltage. In the video on prime factors, we learned how the KV determines the speed and energy at which X-ray photons travel. X-ray photons require energy to make it to the image receptor. One thing we must know is that, even though the KV is what determines the energy of these X-ray photons, photons in the beam do not possess the same energy. Some have a higher KV than others. This means that, while some X-ray photons have enough energy to make it to the image receptor, some die off and do not make it to the image receptor. By increasing the kilovoltage, energy is increased across all photons. You would then have more X-ray photons making it to the image receptor. 
When more X-ray photons make it to the image receptor, a greater radiographic density is produced. This is the story of how kilovoltage affects radiographic density. What is the relationship between kilovoltage and radiographic density? Unlike with MAS, the KV is not linear to the density produced. To double the density, the KV is increased by 15%. To halven the density, the KV is decreased by 15%. This is known as the 15% rule. For example, by what two ways can you double the density of an image produced with 60 KV and 32 MAS? The first way would be to double the MAS by saying 32 multiplied by 2, giving 64 MAS. The other way would be by using the 15% rule on the kilovoltage. Saying, 60 multiplied by 15%, which gives a value of 9, implying that, by adding the 9 to the old KV of 60, the radiographic density is doubled. Take note that, it is often preferred to change the density of an image by changing the MAS. This is because, not only does the KV have an effect on the radiographic density, changes in KV also lead to changes in the radiographic contrast. We learn about contrast in the next video. The next factor influencing the radiographic density is the condition of the patient. The amount of X-ray photons that can successfully pass through the patient to reach the image receptor depends on the thickness of the anatomical part. What this simply means is that, when a patient with a thick anatomical part is being radiographed, less photons will get to the image receptor because this thick part would absorb most of the photons. This would produce an image with less radiographic density. The reverse is the case in patients with thinner parts, less photons would be absorbed by the anatomical part, causing more photons to get to the image receptor, producing an image with great radiographic density. This explains why different exposure factors are used for different patients and for different anatomical parts. Another way the patient's condition comes to play is in the role of pathology. Under this, pathologies can be placed into two groups. The additive pathology group and the destructive pathology group. Additive pathologies would cause the anatomical part to be thicker than it normally is. Because the anatomical part is thicker than it normally is, it would absorb more X-ray photons and allow less to make it to the image receptor, thus producing a reduced radiographic density. Pathologies under this group include edema, ascites, Paget's disease, rheumatoid arthritis and pneumonia. As for the destructive pathology group, the anatomical part becomes thinner than it normally is, allowing more photons to pass through to the image receptor, producing greater radiographic density. Diseases under this group are osteoporosis, osteomalacia, pneumoperitoneum, emphysema and degenerative arthritis. Next, we have the use of secondary radiation grids. In the videos on the control of scattered radiation under our radiographic equipment series, we learn that scattered radiation is bad because it doesn't represent the anatomy that is being examined. The secondary radiation grid performs the function of removing the scattered X-ray photons. Thus, when a grid is used, it absorbs photons producing a lower density, compared to when a grid is not used. In the control of scattered radiation videos, we go into more detail on this. The next factor is the use of intensifying screens. This applies only to film screen radiography. Intensifying screens are placed in front of radiographic films. They have a multiplier effect on photon production by absorbing X-ray photons and producing many light photons. For every single X-ray photon that strikes the intensifying screen, it generates multiple light photons. X-ray films that use intensifying screens are also sensitive to light photons. Thus, this great amount of light photons will produce a great radiographic density. Also, there is a property possessed by intensifying screens, called speed. The speed is the efficiency of the intensifying screen in converting X-ray photons to light. The higher the speed, the more light photons produced per X-ray photon thus, a high-speed intensifying screen would produce a higher radiographic density. Low-speed intensifying screens give lower density but are of course, better than not using intensifying screens at all, which gives an even lower radiographic density. The final factor affecting radiographic density that we would be looking at is processing. It also applies only to film screen radiography. In film screen radiography, images are made visible by a process called development. The activity of the chemical responsible for development depends on its temperature and the time spent developing. High development temperatures and long development times produce images with greater degree of blackening. We can observe that when it comes to radiographic density, numerous factors come to play. Take note that the list of factors we've discussed is by no means exhaustive. 
To keep things simple, we haven't gone into explanation of some other factors. These include the anode heel effect, beam restriction, generator type, filtration, among others. We will go into more detail on these concepts in future. That concludes this video on radiographic density. We look forward to your questions and comments in the comments section or via email. If you love this video and would want more content, please subscribe and share with your colleagues. Until next time, do enjoy the learning process and take care.